One of the channel's non-believers, who posts large numbers of intelligent questions and interacts intelligently with the responses, has been going through all of the channel's videos looking for errors. Thanks, Brett. I really appreciate it. I want this channel to be truthful. And thanks for pointing out that there is a mistake about Herbert Dingle. I said the journals wouldn't publish his refutation of relativity, but he sent it in a letter to Nature in 1962, and the letter was published. It raised quite a bit of controversy and some attempts at refutation, none of which addressed the problem. He took the question to the Royal Society and asked Nature to publish the findings. They refused. So did other journals. He was left with no platform and a number of worthless replies from the top relativists. I hope to be able to share one or two of them in the not-too-distant future. It seems pretty clear that Brett is a serious scientist who studied relativity and is convinced that Einstein's theory is based on solid assumptions, all of which have been soundly verified and that the theory has been convincingly proved by vast numbers of experiments which no other theory can account for. About 30 years ago, I did a review of Einstein's Relativity, the Special and the General Theories. You can find it on Reformation Christian Ministries' website on the Science and Scripture page. The review has a copy of the book with my comments in magenta. Anyone is welcome to read it. My first comments are on Einstein's willingness to equate mathematics and science. I point out that this is not valid. Mathematics deals with abstractions. Science deals with the real world. So unless the assumptions of the mathematicians correspond to the real world, there's no reason to expect any agreement. Einstein claims that by one proposition he can transform geometry into a branch of science which is competent to tell us the truth about the world. Ah, well now, beware the mathemagicians. We don't have time to look at all the comments, but a really important one comes in section 5. Einstein admits the reason for proposing relativity. He claims, without any proof, that the Earth orbits the Sun, and that this motion, in his hypothetical coordinate system, should give what he calls anisotropic properties in space. He then says, however, the most careful observations have never revealed such anisotropic properties in terrestrial physical space i.e. a physical non-equivalence of different directions. And that scientific gobbledygook means the most careful observations have never shown a trace of the Earth's movement around the Sun. And there had been many experiments, from Arago to Michelson and Morley, and all had shown no movement of the Earth. Michelson and Morley was particularly devastating, since Michelson was the leading experimental physicist of his time, and the world had looked on with bated breath, confident that his apparatus would give both the speed and the direction of the Earth through space. There was dismay and disbelief when the results said the Earth was not moving. Einstein claims that this is a very powerful argument for his theory. His theory purports to prove that it's impossible to tell whether anybody in the universe is moving or stationary. So, you can now ignore the observations that the Earth is not moving. If you really want to stick your head in the sand, and most of the scientists did, and still do, well, let's see how he derives his wonderful theory. In section 7, he declares the speed of light to be a constant to all observers, no matter how they are moving. 
and this is a law of nature. An odd declaration, since in his build-up to the theory, he'd used the flight of a raven in an analogous situation, with no hint that a speed could be a law of nature. In fact, all of his logical build-up to the theory becomes invalid in the light of relativity. He'd been using constant lengths and time intervals, but relativity makes lengths shrinkable and time expandable, so all his examples are questionable, if not utterly irrelevant. Another key point for his theory comes in section 8, where he makes a definition of simultaneity. He imagines two lightning strikes at different places far apart, occurring simultaneously. He asks, what is the meaning of saying they occur at the same time? He pretends there's no ready answer. But for centuries, the world had accepted what God said about time measurement. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Time is measured by the movement of the heavenly bodies. The observatory at Greenwich in London was designed and built for that very purpose, and for a very long time Greenwich Mean Time was the standard for the world. That was certainly the case when Einstein wrote his book, the obvious answer to what does it mean by saying that two events occurred at the same time would be, if observers at both places, with clocks synchronised to Greenwich Mean Time or any equivalent standard, recorded the same time for the events, they would be simultaneous. But Einstein defines two events as being simultaneous if an observer at the midpoint, M, between the two events, A and B, sees them happening at the same time. He points out that this requires that the time for light to traverse A to M is the same as to traverse B to M. Einstein then tells us that this is neither a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. His definition is subject to his claim that all observers, however they are moving, and however a light source is moving, will always measure the same speed of light impacting them. It is a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, and it's far from intuitive. In section 12, Einstein introduces measuring rods and clocks in motion. He assumes the Lorentz transformation, the Fitzgerald Lorentz transformation, was a proposition to try to explain away the Michelson and Morley experiment. The pressure of the ether against the apparatus must have shortened one part of the apparatus by just the right amount to give zero velocity for the Earth. That factor was the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. The factor needed to change the zero result of Michelson and Morley to the value they all wanted it to be. And that factor, of course, depends on physical properties of the ether. Einstein goes on to claim that his theory proves there is no ether. That is clearly admitting that as far as his theory goes, the Lorentz transformation is a pure fiddle factor with absolutely no physical justification whatsoever. Brett claims that a reasonable justification for the lens transformation has been found. Should it come as a surprise? If today's mathematicians want to get a result, they can get it. Today's maths is that flexible. The justification that Einstein later made assumed his theory, with its constant light speed for all observers, and is therefore circular reasoning and invalid. 
It was, and will always be, nothing but a fiddle factor. And what about other non-intuitive dictates of his theory? Let's look at some of them next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.